actually all back to Human Humane Architecture uh, here in uh, early April 2020. And Aprils are traditionally uh, the from the American Institute of Architecture, the Architecture Month, where they have events. They're open to the public, so public relations. And if you can get the first slide up, uh, this was a couple of years ago when Jock Lewis was the local AIA Honolulu president, had the genius idea to bring people outside of the AIA office into Fort Street Mall. And uh, it was me and the merging uh, talent, Jonathan Quack, who were actually talking about the neighborhood we were sitting in, which is downtown. And we were talking about converting this very monofunctional uh, fossil inclusive to working only into a very inclusive post-fossil uh, jungleism environment. That was then and now is now because we got again April again in 2020 and if we could get the second slide up because uh, on uh, invitation of the current uh, 2020 AIA Honolulu President Purnima McCutcheon, uh, my uh, co-host is Soto Brown who is with us. Hi to Soto. Hello Martin. And myself, we have been invited to give a uh, pechakucha. So this is a tw uh, come from Japan. It's a 20 minutes, 20 slides, each 20 seconds presentation. And we're happy we have a little bit more time, but not much. And so we want to dive in. And which is the neighborhoods we're sort of dealing with and, and talking about to date in Soto? So we're talking about Kaka'ako, and we prepared this presentation for the AIA meeting, and of course it was canceled because of COVID-19. So we are putting it on ThinkTech instead of presenting it to the people who we're going to be meeting at the IBM building right in the center of Kaka'ako. So I'm starting out with the history of the Kaka'ako area, and in the pictures that you see here, you can see the Kaka'ako originally was very watery. It had standing water, running water, and Hawaiians traditionally had used water for raising crops and raising aquaculture. And as Westerners began to come in, that was not as useful anymore, and wet areas became dry areas. Something else Kaka'ako was well known for, if a picture of the upper right, Salt pans, uh, salt water was poured into shallow enclosures, and as it evaporated, you had salt crystals. And as I said, all of this came to an end in the 1920s and 30s, as you see in the photograph in the bottom right, when all of this watery area was filled in with crushed coral, which was dredged from offshore and pumped ashore, and that turned this area into dry land, and that's why we have the Kaka'ako that we have today. If we go yeah, to you see this, you see uh, Diamond Head in the distance. Oh, which, yeah. Until you're at the very coast, if you're like in Kaka'ako, you can't see anymore because, you know, after that, of course, Waikiki, as the other neighborhood, has been rising uh, high. And oh, so yeah. that blocks the view of uh, Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Very good point. Okay, next picture. We call this area, one of the important parts of this area is that it was once originally owned by the Ward family. There was a man named Curtis Ward who was from the southern United States and he came to the Hawaiian Kingdom in the middle 1800s. And he ended up purchasing a huge piece of property that extended from King Street all the way down to the ocean. And House was located right on King Street, as you can see in these pictures, it was called Old Plantation because that was in homage of him coming from the American South, which was filled with plantations. And there was this two-story grand building, and it was part of this huge piece of property, as I said. And that's why Ward Avenue is named that. It goes through this area. And right around uh -huh. the Ward home uh, were these big ponds as well. This is the area yeah. which today is the Blaisdell Center, which was purchased in 1958 by the city and county of Honolulu. And uh, Blaisdell Center was built in 1964. Yeah, and if, if, you, if I analyze these buildings, they still look, and you, you said from the south on the mainland, they have similar, I mean, not on similar climatic conditions and being very hot in the summer, right? Actually, all three around. Yes. So keeping yourself cool and, in, in, you know, having lanai's wrapped all around. So this was very, 
it came from somewhere else, but it wasn't invasive. We like to call this exotic, right? Exactly, and that is the perfect description of the house. So let's go to the next slide, number four. And we see a picture of what the Kaka'ako area used to look like. It used to be residential. And there were lots of small wooden buildings, one and two story, lots of houses, uh, a very eclectic and inclusive neighborhood of many different races. And there were small businesses incorporated in there, but you can see that there were trees as well. This picture is from 1946. There was a neighborhood school. There was a neighborhood movie theater. And so it was, again, residential. Very, very little of this architecture still remains. There's a handful of these buildings. But other than that, you wouldn't even know that it ever looked like this. Because it's changed so much. And it's changing a great deal more as we go along. In the discussion. Absolutely. Uh, next, in, next slide, we go to number five, is an aerial view from the 1940s. And if you look in the upper left, you can see a large area of trees. That's the Ward Estate. That's the Pole Plantation Home. You can see Ward mm -hmm. Avenue vertically on the left. And on the very far right, you can see just the corner of the end of uh, Oliver Park. But right in the center is Kiwalo Basin. That was dredged in the 1930s. And it became where all of the fishing boats, the fishing fleet, became centered there. They had formerly docked in downtown Honolulu, and then they shifted to Cape Hollow Basin. And also in this area was where the tuna cannery was. So the fishing boats would come ashore, they'd come to the dock, and they'd unload their fish, and they would go directly to that cannery. And so this was a really important part of the whole Kaka'ako area when it was still primarily residential, this connection to the ocean and harbor of Cape Wallow Basin. Yeah. Of course, Cape Wallow Basin is still there, but it's no longer used as much by fishing. Now, your next slide uh, sheds further light on that one, right? Oh, absolutely. So we go to the next mm -hmm. slide, and you can really see that this is, again, this is where the Coral Tuna Factory cannery was. This is the fishing boat fleet docked originally at uh, Kiwalo Basin in the 1930s in the upper right. This is also where the fishing boats were not only docking, but they were actually built there. There were companies that built these fishing sandpans, that they were called. And this is also where they were launched. And most of them were owned by Japanese men. So the, mm -hmm. the fishing fleet staffed by Japanese and the men who built the fishing fleet were also mm -hmm. Okay, going to our next slide, number seven, we see that Kaka'ako began to change, particularly after World War II. And it began to shift into being light industrial. So in the upper picture, in the upper right corner, looking from the Ala Moana building in 1963, you can see that most of those houses are now gone. It's not residential anymore. It's mm -hmm. warehouses, it's car repair, it's all kinds of uh, small manufacturing, all kinds of things like that. So it's become a commercial district more than mm -hmm. residential. Mm -hmm. And going to our next picture, one of the things that really made a difference was the automobile. And that mm -hmm. we know that from a lot of different situations. But Kaka'ako became a place where cars were repaired, car bodies were fixed, cars were repainted, gas stations, and that kind of thing. And also right mm -hmm. along the lower part of Kaka'ako, right along Alamana Boulevard, in the 1950s and 60s into the 70s, there were very big used car lots. And that was something that very commonly occurred in places with big, open, and developed land back yeah. at that time. Big yeah. parking lots, essentially, where people were selling used cars. And that's what we see in these pictures. That gas station was right where we're talking about right now, um, right across the street from what's now the IBM building. Yeah, and, and that's actually, I think the cars and, and the car repairs and the car, everything around the cars is about, uh, you know, in pockets still uh, remaining here and there, while through the redevelopment uh, of residential high-rises of more exclusive nature uh, of the recent days, all these sort of larger industrial um, usages are gone. There's still some of these repair shops, you know, and some of these 
back alley pockets existing about the only thing sort of left from from that era. Yeah, and that's a really good point. And people have mentioned this repeatedly over the past decades. If we get rid of all that late industrial activity, where's it going to go? Because yeah, you yeah. want to get your car repaired, where are you going to take it if Takaako is no longer functioning? Yeah. Well, well, they go to Cali, right, where, where well, I Well, they do. My mechanic, Larry, is. But uh, as they say also that Cali is going to be the next Kakaako to be redeveloped. So we're keeping <laughs> pushing further out and out, right? That's exactly right. I was just going to say exactly the same thing. It keeps getting pushed yeah. away from the city center. Okay, next yeah, picture. Yeah. Um, as time passed and this industrial area began to become like that, some larger buildings were built, too, and there was an area along Alamana Boulevard that was redeveloped by the Ward Estate, which gradually shifting into more commercial clients or people on their land. Um, in the upper right corner, there's a picture of what was called a White Top Restaurant and Drive-In, but the really one of the really big features of Kakaako on Ward Avenue was the Gem Discount Department Store built in the 1960s. And, and that building is still there today. It no longer looks like this, but it's where... Is that where Sports Authority... Oh, I was just going to say. I was yes. curious. Thank you. Yes. Okay. That, is, that was... Uh, the, this is the original use of the wow. building where Sports Authority was. And as you can see, it had this wonderful 60s structure yeah. over the entryway, which, of course, is long gone, and it's been... Well, redone, but the when, facade is very different now. When did they take this down? Um, probably, well, certainly by the 1980s, that was gone. But oh, I can remember, oh God. I can remember yeah. that. And Jim, uh, Jim advertised a great deal, so it was always mm -hmm. being advertised on radio and TV. And so it was What were they selling? Discount department store, so it was, it was just like, oh. um, you know, it was like Walmart. Okay. I see. Really yeah. Walmart, kind of. Yeah. And yeah. No. next picture, we see that the Ward Estate gradually began to redevelop its own property, and they very distinctively built the Ward Warehouse in the 1970s and then the Ward Center in the 1980s. And Ward Warehouse in particular was really 70s. It was made of wood. It had these distinctive painted super graphics on it. And it was a shopping center, and it obviously was more lucrative for them to redevelop from a bunch of used car lots into shopping centers where you got more income. And Ward Warehouse, unfortunately, is now gone, and Ward Plaza, commercial development across the street, is now gone. As we go towards our uh, eventual destination of where Bacock was going, we go to our next picture. And we see a very important building of this area, the IDM building. That was the first high-rise, the, the first multi-story, not, not much of a high-rise, not very tall, but it's the first big multi-story building built there. Early 1960s, very distinctive exterior designed by Vladimir Osipov, very important local architect. And that it you grew up in a house by him. Exactly, mm -hmm. in the house that I will be living in at some point in the near future, the family home designed by him. Yeah. And the IBM building was threatened as the Takaako current redevelopment got underway. People said, why don't you tear that down and build a big high rise? Unfortunately, the Howard Hughes Corporation chose to save it. They turned to their headquarters and they needed the showroom and sales room for the residential high rises that they're now in the process of Next picture, we go to. Well, and, and, oh yeah, and maybe we, we if we sort of conclude because this is where sort of the historic kind of yeah. preview kind of concludes. But maybe summarizing or you know sort of you know uh, just reflecting on you know just the last two projects you showed, War Warehouse, was really innovative with solid timber. You know, it was very zeitgeisty at its time. And so the IMB, IBM building is a very innovative concrete building that we've been talking about. Alfred D was a structural engineer together with Ossie Puffs. And, and they did this really filigree, Brie Soleil. So there's, there's innovation there, right? These are not oh, things that were replicated from the mainland and sort of in an invasive way just dumped on our island. 
yes. as we are basically uh, saying it happens to us. And the little picture on the Ward Warehouse, if we could go back to slide 10 for a second here, at the very top, uh, while the Ward, uh, the Ward Warehouse side has been scraped, it was vacant for too long of a time and some a project has been pulled and recently they announced what they want to put there. And we were, to say the very least, very disappointed. Oh, yeah. Because no innovation anymore. A microwave glass box, which, you know, ticked you off, has no lanai. And, and yeah. Ward Warehouse was all about lanai. Yeah. Walkable, you know, uh, pathways to the stores. And the IBM building is a very bichromatic building that, that is, to a large degree, self-shading itself. Yeah. So, so that being said, if I understood you correctly, Taco Aco has always been a very sort of easy breezy, bioclimatic because there was no other choice back then, but also a very inclusive neighborhood. Yes, exactly. And it has recently, unfortunately, turned into almost the opposite. Right. Into a high-end residential. Uh, there, the majority of them are air-conditioned. Yeah. So. While we don't want to dwell upon that because we want to give a more than ever optimistic uh, view and point out maybe a different way, it gets us to the next slide, number 12. The largest landowners in Kaka'ako are very sort of legendary, famous people and, in fact, innovators. And the first one here is who? Well, uh, that well, is Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes is mm -hmm. an extremely wealthy industrialist, very kooky and uh, crazy man, actually became very crazy when he was elderly. But one of his major innovations was the building of this immense airplane in the 1940s called, it was made of wood, it was made of, of uh, sort of laminated wood. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. referred to as the spruce goose because it was made of wood, not spruce wood, but birch wood, in fact. And he actually developed this, began, he began developing this during World War II with our friend Henry J. Kaiser, who mm, is there a go. big, big guy here, too, in terms of architectural yeah. development. And yeah, um, the Howard Hughes Corporation today, which bears his name, is now the owner of what had been the Ward Estate, and it's the developer of the Hopper right now, which is what we're about to focus on. Yeah. And you know, the, the top right picture is a, one of your presentations uh, that you pointed out. There is a, there is a tradition of post-contact innovation on the, on the Hawaiian Islands that you see some glimpses of here. And so you put Howard Hughes in the role of these, you know, these people. And yes. so, so go to the next slide. The second largest landowner. Um, is also uh, known as as a very significant innovator on the yeah. on the Hawaiian Islands, and who was he or them? Because you said it actually has been two. Yeah. So the other big landowner in the area is the Bishop Estate, and that is the estate that was property owned by Bernice Hawaii Bishop. She was the granddaughter of King Kamehameha the First, and you see him in the statue form on the left. Kamehameha the first, very important in Hawaiian history because he was the chief or the king who united all of the Hawaiian islands into a single kingdom in the early 1800s, and he did that by innovatively using Western uh, warfare, Western weapons, to defeat his enemies, other Hawaiians. And we also see King Kalakaua in the 1880s and the 1870s and 80s who very innovatively traveled all the way around the world first sitting monarch to do so, and who also loved modern inventions, and he loved electricity and telephones and boats and all kinds of stuff like that, and he loved, again, to incorporate modern technology into Hawaiian culture. So, again, innovativeness is a long-standing tradition with Hawaiians using things that came from elsewhere. Absolutely. So it doesn't matter if you're a Haole or if you're a local. Yeah. If you came to Hawaii or if you stayed in Hawaii, you were doing cutting edge things yeah. until, you know, very much, I mean, for sure mid century and, you know, lasting till the 70s and in the 80s, not just limited to, you know, Hawaii, but anywhere in the world from, yeah. as we like to say, when. Uh, basically, um, you know, um, 
Bregan was taking over uh, and Jimmy Carter was made to step down and then when things got sort of down the hill and less innovative. But, yep. you know, we, we should we should have gotten past that. And although we might have still terrible, you know, upper leadership, that shouldn't keep us away from remembering our roots and our tradition. And along these lines, let's go to the next slide, because here are some suggestions how we think, given the innovative nature and character of these owners of the land, how they might want to think about developing their buildings. And right. so the slide number 14 that we uh, please go on now is suggesting not a formal approach. So how the buildings look like don't matter or they matter as a result from their inside out performance. So here are ideas about what our friend Ron Lindgren, hi Ron, um, he will join us soon again for more exciting shows that we're going to do together with him. He likes to call it structural expressionism, and in that tradition here, the emerging generation under our guidance is envisioning these things, where he's just basically built, which you can only do, again, I'm speaking half around the world from you in Germany, where we can build that way. You can't express structure anymore because you always got a rapid and heavy insulation. So that's something that is, gives us a unique position, a unique chance to build distinct and having a unique selling proposition. Our uh, exotic escapism expert, Susanna has taught us. So let's go sort of back to that and dwell on that. Don't build generic invasive and unfortunately Kakaako has become lazy in, in many parts, right? Yeah, I know and the thing that you just said is very crucial here too, because basically what they're doing is building a lot of identical big glass boxes, which they change mm -hmm. the exterior of to make them look a little bit different. It's basically the same thing. Whereas these other buildings that we're talking about now, as you just said, the exterior is only a function of the interior's attributes yeah. or what we're trying to do with the inside out rather than just make a wavy pattern on the front and say, look how pretty it is. Exactly. And so number 15 is the perfect sort of embodiment of that because here is Primitiva 1, how we call her, and it's basically sort of these, you know, uh, cylindric stacklinized, as our friend Kurt Sandborn likes to call them, and they're heavy G. And built environment is a heavy, uh, you know, part being integrated into the natural environment. So they almost come across more as sort of, you know, archive nature, as we like to say, versus architecture. And this is, in fact, here on uh, on the just having been demolished, as you mentioned, War Plaza by Steve Owl, which we haven't been informed what's going to be there. And so we're just saying, well, you know, you as a Bishop Museum historian, me as a founding board member of Dr. Momo, we love the old, but we are aware that, you know, you can't, um, you know, you can't stop times and you shouldn't. You should progress, but then it should be something better you could replace it with than it already was. And these buildings were really, really good. So you got to do much better, right? Yes, yes. So number, next slide, number 16, um, is how Primitiva 1 looks from the inside. And it's pretty much uh, sort of using the, uh, the, 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 the methodology or the, the strategy of individual pods, we call these slices of paradise, which are very confined spaces. In Corona times, we obviously start to rethink, you know, our practices, and, and so, um, here again, uh, the idea is to keep it very multifunctional. Now us being stuck at home, if we don't have big spaces, but smaller ones, if we can keep them flexible and multifunctional, um, that might be a way to feel kind of less stuck, right? Yes, yes. yes. So on, on the next slide, number 17, is, um, is, is a primitiva in the middle of Kaka'ako. This is block, what Kamehameha School calls Block C. And uh, there's a park to be developed in front of that. And once again, uh, we're proposing, again, an, a, a building that is, uh, that is structurally innovative and that is also typologically innovative. Because again, we're talking housing and hosting the people in most need, which were the inhabitants of Kaka'aka to begin with, the working class people, right? Yes, yes, yes. So number, next slide, number 18, is another approach of the next one, of the next Primitiva, this is Primitiva 2, 
again, inside out approach, and everything is more conceived to be like a, a big cascading landscape where people can sort of, you know, uh, pop up their tent temporarily when they're there and when not, they take it down. So, way more efficient and effective ways of dealing with space. Once again, we might say, Corona, we can't do this anymore. Yes, we can. We just got to keep the distance, right? Yeah. And something we were discussing that these might actually be way more suitable for actually addressing the current virus issue because by bringing nature in, right. you're actually sort of helping your immune system to be prepared for it rather than locking yourself down. And you have used another sort of, you know, tragic event from the past uh, with the uh, Legionnaire's tongue tied, how we call it, and please spell it out in English. <laughs> <laughs> Legionnaire's disease, which was uh -huh. spread through buildings and still is spread through buildings by central air conditioning systems. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So if you go to the next slide, the second to last number 19, um, you know, this traces back to the very beginning where we were saying when we're more building more skinny buildings, more skinny towers and denser to each other, we might, you know, learn from how nature does it in a jungle or in the forest or in a bamboo grove, and you actually get a more pleasant, more urban, more experiential urban fabric than how you describe, you know, being more sort of spread out yeah. and not really being connected. You call yeah. them like autistic, self-referential money-making machines, right, and right. don't really form uh, a neighborhood. Right. And and the, the, the high-rises being constructed in Kaka'ako now are so monolithic and have such big bases that what you find is these very widely spaced monolithic structures that don't really lend themselves to have building a neighborhood or building any kind of street activity that you point out is where you grew up in, a, in an urban area with a lot of urban activity it was walkable. Absolutely. And we're at the end of the show. We go to the last slide. Um, and uh, we will say, well, we in Kaka'ako, we will keep watching the development as these sort of quotes of previous shows demonstrate. We both will point out practices that we're critical about, but we also obviously enjoy more to so talk about promising attempts, which we see at the top left there, this Holinahona. And on the, t on the top right is, is, again, sort of our sort of mentor. This is Richard Lowe, who actually worked with Victoria Wars, who you had mentioned. And we had mentioned Steve Au, who had built the most innovative buildings. And he was proposing these skinny towers here. Yeah. And so uh, skinny towers are obviously, you know, again, a part of a genetic code of the most innovative era. So might want to be reconsidered. Yes. So with that, I uh, hope you join us next week again for another exciting episode of Human Humane Architecture. And until then, um, most importantly, hopefully you stay safe and sound. And so healthy. See you next, exactly. So see you next time, Ms. Soto. Looking forward to and everyone else. And until then, bye-bye. Aloha.